this is a particularly exciting panel, which is going to be run in two parts. We are going to have first uh, a chat uh, with Representative Ken Buck, uh, Colorado from the US Congress. He has played a particular role, I have to say, uh, in uh, the US discourse in recent years as a, as, a, as a Republican really being aware of the issues and the problems that are associated with uh, the rise of uh, big digital companies, the implications that this has for democratic discourse in the end. So Ken has also been someone who has been pushing legislation uh, in various forms. Um, and, and we'll talk about that. And he will be in conversation uh, with Marco Yancity of Harvard Business School. And then we'll broaden the discussion to the rest of the panel, who, which contains a combination of lawmakers. Uh, we have attorney general of Texas and enforcers and uh, uh, opinion makers and uh, uh, various other uh, very uh, uh, attractive characters. So let me start with with you too. The title of this is Online Harms, AI and Democracy. And uh, Ken, to start with you, you have been uh, really very much at this uh, center stage in, the, in the, the, the attempt in the US to bring forward uh, some form of regulation of digital that was meaningful. There have been, as we know, multiple attempts to just launch bills. You yourself have been associated with sponsoring important bills. Uh, some have come through, particularly the venue bill, but substantively not much uh, has happened relative to Europe, and we'll talk about it in a moment. But I wanted to start this discussion with your sense for uh, well, we kind of know why, but where is this discussion on regulation potentially going in the US? Is it still very much, who knows, up in the air, it will never happen because lobbying is too great, or uh, what is your sense for where this might go? First, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and having me. And, and second, uh, one of the first things I learned in public life was never to speak mid-afternoon because everybody falls asleep. <laughs> So I hope everyone here has had plenty of uh, uh, caffeine because it's very difficult to make antitrust interesting um, without caffeine, much less uh, mid-afternoon. So um, let, me go, let me take a step back, if I can, Christina, and just talk about what happened in the last Congress and then uh, where uh, things probably will go. The, the last Congress uh, was very interesting. We passed six uh, antitrust bills from the Judiciary Committee in the House. Um, David Cicilline, uh, absolute superstar, I will miss him uh, uh, while we are uh, different on 99% of the issues that we uh, face. We uh, had a lot of uh, synergy on, on uh, antitrust and, and did a lot of great work together. Um, but those six bills did not hit the floor uh, for one very simple reason. We had the votes on the Republican side. We had the votes on the Democrat side. Um, there, was, there was great bipartisanship, and there, and there rarely is in, in this day and age, but there was great bipartisanship. Didn't hit the, the floor because of Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi. Um, the same happened in the Senate. Great uh, bipartisanship with Senator Klobuchar and uh, Senator Lee. Um, uh, a number of uh, Democrat senators, Republican senators on the Senate Judiciary Committee um, were moving bills, um, didn't hit the Senate floor for one very simple reason, Senator Schumer. And uh, they, it wasn't because we didn't have the better argument, we did have the better argument. Um, and that's why we got such bri broad bipartisan support. And it wasn't because we didn't have popular support. We did have popular support. The, the grassroots in America is absolutely in favor of competition, and they feel um, that there is something, and I'm, I'm going to use a phrase from my daughter that I'm looking around the room, and very few of you have the same color hair that I have, but, but she says, Dad, it's creepy. So um, that's her technical term in the antitrust world for lack of competition, and it's just plain creepy. When I go and look for a pair of cowboy boots, and for three weeks, every time I turn on my computer, there's an advertisement for a pair of cowboy boots, or I drive by a Ford store after I'm looking for a pickup truck, and they're following me in every way possible, and I'm turning off all those uh, tracking devices, it's just creepy. And so Americans understand that, and they want change. 
Um, but these companies spent tens of millions of dollars in the political system. Um, they didn't darken my doorway, but they did in a number of areas. Um, they didn't move the, 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 nor the, the sort of uh, 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 rank and file members of the House or Senate, but uh, they certainly moved leadership. Now, I've taken my shot at Democrats. Let me take my shot at Republicans. Um, the current administration with Kevin McCarthy um, and Jim Jordan as uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee will do absolutely nothing. And, and they'll do nothing, and it's, to me, as a Republican, it's a disgrace because we are constantly, I've said it a thousand times and I've heard it 10,000 times, we want strict constructionists on the bench. We don't want the judiciary uh, making law. We want them interpreting law. And then at the same time, my, my colleagues, a couple of my colleagues are saying, well, let the marketplace deal with this. We don't need to interfere with, with Congress. So if you say the courts shouldn't do anything, and if you say the uh, legislative branch shouldn't do anything, what you're saying is we don't want anything to happen. And, and that comes from a whole lot of money being put into a whole lot of pockets, and, and that's just plain wrong. Again, they don't win ideologically. They don't win um, with popular support. They win because they are making such gross amounts of money that they can buy the system. Um, fortunately, I'm not going to make this a Debbie Downer moment for everybody, but fortunately, uh, there is good news. And, and the good news is uh, the Texas Attorney General uh, sitting over there. I just want to make clear if there are any cameras in the room that he is to the left of me. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, is, uh, it is real important. We were able to pass a bill that uh, empowered uh, the attorney generals to keep cases in their own district. They were always getting moved to the backyard of uh, these big tech companies in, in Silicon Valley. Um, we were able to uh, make sure that we got some more resources for the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. Um, so those things, going forward, we, we hope there is more enforcement activity. Um, unfortunately, uh, it will be a very big uh, uh, challenge for us to get more done in this Congress, um, especially with David leaving uh, uh, the U.S. House. Um, there is a chance that we could get one or two bills done um, and everyone's going to say, well, tell us what those one or two bills are. Um, the one bill that I think is the, the most, uh, deals with the most egregious conduct is what I call the ad tech bill. And that is to make sure that Google can't control all three sides of the digital advertising world. And, and that's a bill that we will uh, focus on. Uh, the other uh, two bills are sort of the non-discrimination bill, and it affects a number of these tech companies, or the, um, uh, the uh, sort of the um, uh, platform uh, bill that, that uh, Marsha Blackburn has with, with Amy Klobuchar. But I think those two are the uh, two of the bills that, that may pass um, if we can do enough of the procedural uh, maneuvering to get those passed. The nice thing about having a five-vote majority in the U.S. House is uh, leadership knows they need those five votes. Um, they didn't have them for the speaker race, and so that took many, many hours, um, and it was a clear message that uh, uh, we hopefully can get, get some things done like that. So you have been concerned uh, about unfair business practices of big tech, but also very prominently about uh, issues of uh, accountability and transparency. And you have a book which is uh, out there as well on the particular effect and the concerns you have around uh, discourse and democratic discourse. And so there's a uh, current case or recent case in front of the Supreme Court on Article 230, which is being debated on uh, responsibility of platforms ultimately. We are all watching Twitter descend with morbid fascination into some sort of chaos. So um, I know this is a concern of yours, and we'll talk about AI in a second, but just give us again a sense for what the main focus and how do you think this, this fight against uh, particularly Google, but others too, takes the form of a, a pro-democracy fight in your mind? So for, for me, what convinced me that this was a, a, an essential issue is speech. 
Um, in a democracy, if one company controls 94% of the searches online, that company controls the flow of information. If it controls the flow of information, it has an undue influence on elections. Um, and I, I believe that it, it had an, an influence on elections. Um, and I believe that given its uh, morality in how it conducted itself, um, and I'm talking about Google, I'm not trying to um, mince words here, uh, in, in the whole legislative process, uh, that they will continue to act that way and do everything they can to maintain their monopoly. We can't allow that. We have to have competition um, in the search uh, marketplace, and it is essential that uh, we move in that direction. The same is true with the phone platforms. Uh, the same is true with the, uh, since, since more and more of the world uh, is getting their news through streaming uh, rather than cable and uh, more uh, old-fashioned methods. Uh, we need to make sure that there are streaming services and, and, and not controlled by uh, just a few companies. So in my view, the democratization uh, issue is the key issue in uh, all of this, and I think it is the issue that really appeals to both sides of the political spectrum the most. And now there's a new kid on the block in some sense, right? There is AI, we've been also following this uh, very recent uh, surge, and the concern inevitably is, is that going to make things worse? I know this is something you ask yourself, and immediately in this context, people think, how should we deal with this? So I'd like you to start on this and then pass on to Marco, who is a professor at HBS and somebody who has worked on AI quite closely, but I'd like to see you to take it away a bit. Sure, so in my view, um, uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the whole uh, group uh, has the potential to open up uh, search, uh, search being the most uh, profitable of uh, what these platforms do. Um, perhaps Bing is more competitive with Google down the road as a result of AI, perhaps not. Um, but AI could be, and, and, and first of all, let me just say, um, we can't lose to China when it comes to AI. We can't over-regulate um, and not innovate. At the same time, we can't have a lack of competition and not innovate. Uh, China is not a country that shares our values. And uh, as we have seen with Russia recently, and, and there will be three hotspots in the world in the next three or four years, uh, we cannot allow that to happen. So I think we have to have an eye towards how do we make sure that we uh, uh, support the development of AI in a safe way, and with, with not that these companies necessarily share our values, but they share our values better than some of the countries that would uh, like to use AI for nefarious, nefarious purposes. So I think that uh, AI has a lot of uh, potential to do uh, great things in, in healthcare and so many other areas, uh, but as it pertains to search, we need to make sure that we do have competition uh, with AI so that uh, it is uh, something that helps us in, in terms of uh, spreading information in, in, in the country. Great comments and, and, and really good thoughts. And, and uh, it's an interesting time to be doing this right now uh, because I feel like we've really had a major moment uh, in the history of technology and the history of AI specifically. When um, ChatGPT3 was introduced November 30th of this year uh, in a period of about two months, it signed on about 100 million users, which is an incredible uh, increase, just mind-blowing increase. And uh, it is really a major change in how AI is structured, how it works, what it does is potential for both good and bad, right? So the game has just changed. And I think they will remember this time a little bit like maybe how we remembered, you know, when uh, Mark Andreessen introduced Mosaic and back those days in uh, 93 and 94 and Netscape and, and all of that. It's really gonna change the game around AI. Uh, why? Because it's really different. Uh, traditional AI has been set up in a very specific way. So machine learning works on very specific use cases. Like uh, we were talking about agriculture this morning, so one of my favorite ones actually is in, uh, in agriculture. This was actually done in China, so uh, yeah, uh, this, uh, no further comment on that. But basically it's, it's, a, it's a system to insure pigs. Apparently they have a lot of pigs and they need to be insured. And it turns out you can use AI, for example, to do facial recognition on pigs. Very exciting application. And so how do you do that? Well, you get a lot of pig faces and you train the AI and what the AI can do is the 
basically uh, it fulfilled that purpose and does that specifically and it works well and you can kind of automate the process. Recognizing pigs by humans is hard and so it's nice that AI does that. So, but machine learning fundamentally is a huge variety of these very narrow uh, use cases uh, that in some ways are a little scary because they can replace what humans do, but typically recognizing pigs is not your ideal job and so many of these things are not, are not, uh, are not that exciting. Uh, now, generative AI is fundamentally different, right? Because we're talking about general artificial intelligence. And so these, um, these algorithms are powerful enough that they can simulate many different things that humans do. And so it's fundamentally, it's almost like a philosophical uh, change, right? And how do you feel about this? Um, uh, to the extent they were getting close on things like the Turing test and stuff like that. These things are pretty human, including the fact that they cheat and they, they lie and all kinds of things. Um, and it's an interesting moment um, because, again, it's like there's a whole new range of things that will change as a function of this. Now, is it going to be one question, maybe to, to, to just tee it up, uh, two more po quick points, but one of them is, is it going to be pro-competitive or not? And that's an interesting question. AI traditionally has all been about data. And do you have the right data? And how much data do you have and all that? Generative AI is also about data, but all the data that gets ingested by these massive algorithms is public. Uh, pretty much, at least so far, we, you know, we're ingesting Wikipedia, we're ingesting all these copyrighted things that people are having all kinds of concerns about and things like that. But basically, you're just taking all the stuff that's up on the World Wide Web and sticking it into train an algorithm, which then is so highly trained that it can solve a broad variety of problems, essentially. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting thing. So, so data itself is not really a barrier because it's out there. Uh, the barrier has shifted over to, in many ways, compute capacity. So it took a billion dollars to train ChatGPT3. That's a lot of compute capacity. And so we're going back to basically almost like a traditional scale barrier, which could concentrate the markets. Uh, but it's not going to be the kind of nonlinear um, network effect like thing uh, with a winner take all outcome. Um, so, from that so it's kind of interesting. So we do have definitely dynamics there. And uh, Christina. So, yeah. so how do you see, how do you see a potential regulatory? effort in that direction? Where should it be focused or legislative direction? Uh, yeah, so, so yes, it, it, it's, it's an interesting, so part of this is also understanding where this thing is going to go, right? Because we're just at the beginning. We, we have a clunky browser, you know, like back in the days of, you know, 94 and 95 when you're browsing the web and it was all pretty clunky and messy. Uh, this is sort of, ChatGPT right now is powerful, but it's just the beginning. This thing's this thing is going to get better by, you know, six orders of magnitude. Like if you look at sort of how much the technology is going to progress, the hardware behind it, as well as the extent to which the algorithms themselves uh, will, will progress over time and the learning curves around all of that. So this thing is going to get a lot better. So right now it's pretty good already. Criticized plenty, uh, but the, again, the future is going to get interesting. There's going to be two levels of this. You're going to have platforms and you have applications, right? Kind of like a lot of things, a lot of digital things these days. And so there's gonna be a few platforms. Um, I believe you're gonna have a lot of the traditional players there. Um, uh, hopefully not too many, but enough. Not too many because we can know who they are and regulate them, and if you want accountability and transparency, that's a good thing to have because you go in and, and, and you know, make sure that these things are being used in a way that is, um, you know, so from a regulatory perspective, reasonable. On top of that, you're going to have millions of people writing applications of these things, and already this is starting to happen. So half of Y Combinator this year is about generative AI applications, just to give you a sense. So we're talking about already hundreds of companies essentially being started around this and more going forward. But surely there is a concern, and I'm going to pass on to, to Ken and then move on, about you know, we need to think about an AI gate, gatekeeping problem. I mean, this is not this is not easy, and it is not sounding that uh, that reassuring, frankly, Marco. I am not saying it is. Never said it was a good thing. It's just happened. <laughs> <laughs>
I hope, Marco, that I'm not the first person that the AI um, confuses uh, the facial recognition with a pig. Yeah, no, I, no, no, I, no, no. It's no. undoubtedly going to happen. I just don't want to be that person. Um, I, but I, I do think that the, the really interesting issue is that uh, in order to be successful in AI, you need to have massive computing ability and you yeah. need to have a massive database. And there's only a few companies in the world that can, that right. can create that. Yeah. And so we're not really talking about fixing the competition problem. We might be talking about instead of one, having two or three, yeah. but we're not talking about 10 airlines yeah. or, or you know, 20 car makers. Well, it, it's, it's sort of, it's interesting, like how many would you like to have, right? So in the sense, because like you're stuck between on the one hand, you need to have enough so you have a competitive environment. You don't want to have so many so you can't regulate and you can't really have transparency. You don't want to have a thousand of these because then it would be a nightmare to figure out all the different things that are going on. And so uh, you're kind of stuck between sort of the national security and making sure that these things are being used in a way that is possible to regulate and something that becomes uh, anti-competitive. And one of the things that will happen is that the, the barriers to entry will go down. So from the perspective of investment, that's going to come down. Now, the models are going to get more complex, and so it's a moving target, right? But I still don't find that reassuring. Two or three I'm ain't not, enough. Just, you know. um, let me let me just uh, shift slightly to to your left and. Um,